In July 2015, gaming news site Gamatsu came across a trademark filing from Sony for a video game related product named Nomageddon. The internet soon became rife with rumour and speculation about what exactly this was. The name would crop up again in the Sony rumour mill nearly two years later when a Reddit user claimed in February 2017 that Nomageddon was a western style game from Sucker Punch Productions. However, this hearsay went without proof and the enigma that was Nomageddon remained. I contacted various ex employees from Sony to put the mystery to rest. Nomageddon was a project belonging to Sony Interactive Entertainment's San Diego subsidiary, which is sometimes referred to as SD Studio, or simply Sony San Diego. This division of Sony made its debut in 2002 with an original IP for the PlayStation 2 called The Mark of Cree. However, much of the creative force behind that project departed the company after it was finished. The remaining members of Sony San Diego branch after that would make mostly sports games, including yearly installments of NBA for PlayStation platforms. What's not widely understood, however, was how the subsidiary actually operated from this point on. In the mid-2000s, the studio was divided into two sections. One side of it would develop the main version of a game for a home console, whereas the other would simultaneously work on a port of that title for Sony's portable system at that point in time. This arrangement began with NBA 06. One team made the PS2 version, while the other ported it to PSP. These two groups worked at the same location, but in two separate buildings with little interaction interaction between the two. They both had their own individual managers, staffing matters like job interviews were handled completely separately. For the most part, it was as though they were two different companies. The developers that I spoke to even sometimes referred to them as such. For a long time, the portable development department of Sony San Diego existed almost in the shadow of its counterpart. The home console side took the lead on projects and got to occasionally experiment with its own original IPs like 2007's Pain for PS3. The portable side, on the other hand, was wasn't generally afforded such creative freedom, that gradually began to change in around 2010. Previously they had been working solely on NBA games for PSP when the NBA rights holders unexpectedly raised the cost of the license to around 15 to 20 million dollars. Sony was not willing to cover such costs and the deal ended. With their tenure doing NBA titles finished, they were finally given an opportunity to tackle some original projects of their own. The arrival of the PlayStation Vita saw them working on a handheld sequel to Mod Nation Racer. It was successful enough to open the door for them being able to handle projects with more independence. In 2013, the managers of the subsidiary held what they called a PlayStation Game Jam. Developers were tasked with each coming up with a premise for a completely new game and pitching it to them. The ideas they deemed most interesting would get a shot at being made. Two concepts emerged victorious from this internal competition. The first, a survival game about escaping a zombie outbreak, would be given priority and enter full production first. The other, which would be developed slowly in the background of the other project was a game about gnomes. The concept for it originated from a special effects artist at the company. It was intended to be an online action game involving factions of god and gnomes fighting one another. Among the heads of staff it was received well. A very small allocation of their 50 total developers was put onto the project while the majority of them went to work on the zombie game. At a very early point the call was made to pursue a free to play model for the two titles. According to former developers this was partly an attempt on Sony's behalf to tap into the growing free-to-play market on mobile platforms at the time. Sony San Diego staff were apparently happy to be doing something original, but some held some deep reservations about the payment system. In 2014, after about a year into development, the two games had made some progress. A few more staff were transitioning to the Gnome game, which had picked up the working title of Gnomageddon. Meanwhile, that other project had been going through some big changes. A senior staffer had apparently remarked that zombies had become overplayed and instructed the developers to alter the game's premise to instead be about mutants. With this change in direction, it would become known as Killstrain. Work on Nomageddon would last around three years altogether, and it was being built by a small group of people. Over those few years, Killstrain was subject to various setbacks, meaning some staff were transferred from Nomageddon to assist them. Confidence at the studio for Killstrain had dwindled somewhat. Former staff say that the game lacked solid direction and a much-needed visionary to guide it, someone with a strong sense of 
what it was really supposed to be, it ended up as a top-down MOBA game that pitted mercenaries against mutants in a futuristic setting. Although there was some enthusiasm about it, others at Sony failed to see what the game's hook was. Nomageddon by all accounts was a different story. It had a visionary with big ideas at the helm, and despite no more than 11 people being assigned to it at any one time, its developers believed it was coming along well. It was an online third-person action game in which each player controlled one member in a party of heroic garden gnomes who were charged with fighting a faction of evil garden gnomes. The game was set to be split into three main modes. The first one they developed was a simple versus mode. For all intents and purposes, this was a team deathmatch setup where two teams forfeit territory. Originally, the versus mode was the project's focus, and the developers had intended to mimic the style of a MOBA. There were six different classes of gnomes available, each with their own unique playstyles and abilities. These were fighter, tank, assassin, mage, marksman, and support respectively. Each were equipped with various makeshift weapons cobbled together from supplies found around the gardens and sheds of the neighbourhood. The other two modes were called Raid and Holdout respectively. Holdout was a game type similar to Horde mode from Gears of War. Waves of malevolent gnomes controlled by the game's AI were invading your garden, and alongside several other teammates, you had to defend it. In particular, you had to protect the garden shed. If the enemies were able to reach it and destroy it, the game was over. If you succeeded, each player would receive a sizable payout of loot. This could then be used to upgrade your customizable gnome character with new abilities and weapons to make them more powerful. Raid lastly was the closest thing the game had to a campaign. It was another cooperative mode in which you and your fellow gnomes had to go on the offensive and seize an enemy garden. This would involve completing a set objective, which ranged from freeing friendly AI gnomes who had been taken prisoner or stealing loot from their shed. Occasionally raid players would trigger a boss encounter. These were much bigger and tougher computer controlled enemies. An example of one of these was called a Flamingo. This was a garden flamingo ornament being ridden by gnomes who would hurl molotov cocktails in your direction. These would ignite fires on the garden lawn and if the heroes came into contact with one, it would deal considerable damage. They could, however, run under a sprinkler to extinguish themselves. Every mode in the game would have been completely free to access with no restrictions on playtime. It would have generated revenue by offering optional microtransactions. A developer I spoke to likened its approach to Overwatch, saying that the game would have had crates of loot players could purchase, containing new skins, characters, buffs and other perks. Nomageddon was also planned to have a side game option to keep players engaged between battles. Players could collect smaller gnomes from winning matches and loot boxes, then dispatch them to complete side missions on their behalf. The player would have had no direct control over them, instead having to choose which mission to send them on after weighing up the risk factors. If the little gnomes were successful, they would return to give you the spoils of their victory, extra loot. A couple of developers had started to map out an extensive amount of lore to help add more meaning to the game's world. Its backstory, which had its tongue firmly in its cheek, borrowed from real life history, and even offered a whimsical explanation for how the gnomes had first become sentient. In the 1870s, Philip Griebel was a German pioneer in gnome creation who's widely thought to be the father of the garden gnome as we know it today. He sculpted a line of 21 garden gnomes based around folklore and invented fanciful stories about each one of them coming to life. A traveller named Sir Charles Isham purchased these gnomes and returned with them to his home in England, where he would kickstart the trend of displaying gnomes as garden accessories. In Nomageddon's take on the tale, Philip Griebel crafted the gnomes and their individual stories to cheer up his sick daughter. He sold them to Charles Isham reluctantly in order to cover his daughter's medical bills. However, unbeknownst to Isham, Griebel had made his gnomes with such affection that he had magically willed them to life. After being shipped to England, the sentient gnomes realised that the magic inside each of them can be used to bring other garden ornaments to life. Some years later, Isham passes away and his estate sells them to various owners around the world, where they spread their life-giving rainbow energy. Living garden gnomes have quietly become commonplace since then. The story of Gnomageddon was set in modern-day suburbs, and followed a particular group of friendly and dutiful gnomes who guard their neighbourhood against pests and owners with no green thumbs. One day, their turf becomes threatened by a new set of gnomes on the block, and their leader, the tyrannical Conquest, a large villain gnome with a tragic past. Conquest was once a kind gnome named Larry, who fell in love when his owners added to their garden collection an angel statue. Due to the angel being cracked from having once been smashed and glued back together, Larry was unable to bring it to life on his own, his powers insufficient. He then searched for a licorice plant, an ingredient which is said 
said to have been used by the original 21 gnomes to enhance their magical abilities. Unable to find one of these in his neighborhood, a frustrated Larry kicked over a bin, and out of it tumbled a discarded pack of black licorice candy, which in a moment of desperation, he consumed. Due to black licorice candy being quote unquote, the most vile and disgusting candy on the planet according to the game, it twisted and corrupted him, warping him into a dark version of himself. The transformation drained him of his life-giving rainbow energy, leaving him unhinged and angry. He concocts an evil plan to reap his fellow gnomes of their energy by either corrupting or destroying them. He gathers more discarded black licorice candy and begins force feeding it to other gnomes, amassing an army and storing their rainbow energy in a ceramic cube as it leaves their bodies. However, the dark leader's plans are foiled when his human owners decide to move houses and leave the cube behind before he can use it. Forced to start all over again, Larry, who has since taken on the moniker of Conquest, spreads his army over the neighbouring gardens to either corrupt or kill whatever gnomes they cross paths with. The battle for the neighbourhood between the player-controlled hero gnomes and Conquest's League of Ceramic Minions is on. These plot details were very early, but the developers responsible for them already had some vivid ideas for the world building they hoped to accomplish. They'd even given some thought for a potential sequel or DLC expansion to be released further down the line that would continue the story. Gnomageddon would have had an ending sequence of some kind in which Conquest would have finally succeeded in gaining enough magical energy for his ritual and giving his angel love the gift of life. However, in a twist, the living angel would turn out to be far more evil than even Conquest himself ever was. With her powers overwhelmingly strong from receiving so much energy, she threatens to destroy the neighbourhood itself. In a follow-up of some sort, we were intended to see Conquest team up with the heroes from the first story to stop her. It was never figured out how exactly a lot of this storytelling would have worked in the game, but one developer did suggest that some of the lore might have ended up being released externally on the game's website or social media. After all, this was an online multiplayer game and the team was putting gameplay first. Their approach might well have been paying off because it was apparently very well received among test audiences that were brought in by Sony to play in development builds of the game. It's also said to have been well liked internally, notably more than Killstrain was. It was through no fault of its own that Nomageddon was never finished. Its demise was down to the failure of the studio's other game, Killstrain, a project that a lot of the Nomageddon team had little to no involvement with. Killstrain marked a considerable financial loss for Sony. It was originally intended to be made in only a year or two, being announced in December 2014. But due to how often it meandered creatively and struggled to find an identity for a lot of that time, it took about three and a half years to complete and racked up development costs estimated by former staff to be around 15 to 16 million dollars. It was eventually released on July 19th, 2016. Its launch didn't pan out quite as well as Sony San Diego's staff had expected. While high volumes of activity recorded for its first days did show signs of promise, the numbers would soon drop off. Former staff blame this largely on Sony's lack of promotion for the game. The publisher's efforts to publicize Killstrain were minimal, and this irked people at Sony San Diego. Apart from a handful of videos posted to the official PlayStation YouTube channel, there was next to nothing advertising it to players. The biggest issue that the developers took with Sony's treatment of the title was its placement on the PSN store. For its first week on the market, it was displayed front and center. After that, however, it disappeared from the front page and could only be discovered by digging around in the store's free-to-play games. This lack of visibility stopped Killstrain from growing, limiting its ability to bring in revenue. A former SD Studio developer said, I don't think they grasp that in free-to-play games, only 2% of the people playing actually give you money. Unless you have millions of people playing, you won't make any money, so they basically kill their own game by not pushing it harder. Killstrain's audience in its initial months was small, but not without its dedicated users. To appease them and hopefully attract new users, Sony San Diego's managers instructed their staff to continue preparing new content and updates to improve it. Nomageddon's developers were pulled off the project and put on a Killstrain to assist them with this. Everything at the studio was mired in uncertainty from this point on, as workers were given a nebulous amount of time to make Killstrain better. It seems that few anticipated what was to come. Some told me they believed the failure of Killstrain would be overlooked, and that Nomageddon's potential would keep them afloat. Just less than two months after Killstrain came out, Scott Rohde, the head of product development for Sony's US division, told them that they couldn't see a future for the game. Some staff were under the impression there would be a handful of layoffs, but Sony had something more radical in mind. They were shutting their entire wing of SD Studio down. All 50 or so members of staff involved with either Killstrain or Nomageddon, including management, were promptly let go. Among those affected would have 
developers who had worked there for over 15 years. Former members of the studio say they were abruptly ushered out of the building the morning this happened without being able to take samples of their work. They were allegedly told that Sony would contact them at a later date to send them the material they needed, but it appears only a small handful of developers actually received theirs. For everyone else, they were cut off from preserving their work and weren't allowed to re-enter the disused offices. As an entire section of Sony San Diego or a whole studio depending on how you define it was dissolved, Nomageddon also met its end. Had it continued on its intended schedule, it would have come out some time in 2017. Meanwhile, the surviving half of SD Studio remained open to continue working on MLB and other side projects. How Nomageddon would have turned out, we will never know, but its developers speak of their time on it fondly and many of them continue to believe in its potential. These experiences form a contrast to the rocky development of Killstrain, the project that ultimately sealed its fate. After support for the game was dropped, Sony switched its servers off just less than a year on from its release on July 1st, 2017. If you've enjoyed this video, please don't forget to subscribe and check out my other videos for more exclusive looks at lost video games. Unseen 64 is an archive for cancelled, unreleased and unseen video games. You can visit the site at unseen64.net. I've been Liam, I hope you found this video to be of interest and have fun.